Thank you, John, uh, for being with us today. So we have John Pearson here on the podcast, the Lift Your Shop podcast here with us today. John is residing from Alaska, um, and he, is, he has two shops there, but he also has a shop in Arizona. And so we're going to be digging in a little bit in terms of John's background of how he got started and how he then went about managing a, another shop in a totally different state that's super far away from him that I'm super interested in getting to know more about. But John, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, what kind of your background in this industry and how um, you kind of got started? Yeah. Um, so right after high school, I grew up in Kansas. I decided I want to, wanted to work on cars for a living. Um, about 2006, I attended UTI in the Phoenix area. Um, I went through their basic automotive program, the Ford FACT program, and then I was picked up for Volvo cars. Um, everything that I wanted came true and I got a job in Kansas City working for a Volvo dealership. Um, but very quickly I realized as a new technician that school didn't really te you, teach you what you needed to know to do this job. Um, I was supposed to be paired with um, a mentor that didn't happen um, and I was put on flat rate right away. So it was a bit of a struggle. Um, definitely broke some stuff, did some stuff not right, and had some problems. Um, about nine months into working at that dealership, they let me go. Um, part of it was quality um, because I was rushing things so that I could feed myself. Um, part of it was this was 08 when everyone was kind of struggling. Um, so at that moment, when they let me go, I knew that I liked Arizona. I had a lot of fun in school in Arizona and I moved back to Arizona um, to work at another Volvo dealership. Two weeks in, they said my personality doesn't fit in. I didn't quite know what to do there um, and just kept on trucking. Um, there's a racing school in Arizona that races Corvettes and teaches people how to drive on the racetrack. Um, and I was lucky enough to get a job there at eight bucks an hour, but it didn't matter. It paid bills and it put food in my mouth. Yeah. Um, and all I did was fix Corvettes and test drive Corvettes on the racetrack. After about two years, I was making 12 bucks an hour and I decided, you know what? I'm not going to be able to chase my dreams and do what I want to do um, at this. And I don't see myself moving up at this facility. Um, I wanted a career change, didn't want to be in the automotive industry anymore. So I thought it'd be a good idea to join the army and learn how to work on helicopters. Um, nice. per, per the needs of the military, they said, you're going to Fairbanks, Alaska. So I don't want to do that. <laughs> Tough luck. You're going to Fairbanks, Alaska. Um, so when I got there, wasn't a fan of it for the first year. Um, second year, I was starting to like it a little bit more and I bought this big house that had an 1800 square foot garage. And in my free time, I started flipping cars and helping out friends with their vehicles. And, but the problem was, is I was getting better at my job, unlike working at Volvo. And um, things just started to snowball. There's more and more cars in my driveway. Now I got a really big driveway because it's Alaska, middle of nowhere, yeah. but there's a lot of cars. Um, and so I'm doing the military thing, tinkering here and there. Um, when I get to my unit, the helicopter I'm prescribed to work on has been discontinued. So there's no way to get promoted because they're not going to need anybody in the future. Um, so my military resume is just going to look pretty poor. Um, so I decided that this isn't for me. It's not an efficient enough operation. Um, I really wanted to wake up in the morning and bleed red, white, and blue and America, hell yeah, kind of thing. And yep. I just didn't get those feelings um, in that situation. Everyone has a different experience. Um, so I did transition out of the military um, while I was in Alaska. And during my transition out is when I really ramped up um, my auto repair stuff. Um, I didn't think it would pay my bills. I didn't think that an independent auto repair shop was the way to go. Um, I've always 
just going to school and hearing about it back in the mid 2000s it was they're slummy they're dirty they don't take care of their people um and i didn't know if i really wanted to do that but i had to go some direction um so i just i found a guy that helped me uh fix cars out of my personal garage that had the lift in it um and then we found a, a one bay auto repair shop or a one bay room 30 by 30 room um, that we could move the, from my house into this commercial location. Um, so we move into this commercial location, one lift, some tire machines, and a little tiny hallway of an office. Um, about a year and a half in, the construction company that I'm renting this property from, I'm able to talk them into building an addition onto the building so I can go from one to five base. Um, I don't know what that guy saw in me or why he wanted to invest and put $100,000 out there for $1,800 more a month worth of rent, <laughs> but he did it. Um, and then he talked the bank into loaning me another 40 grand for new lifts. I don't know why they did it. Everyone got paid back. Um, but eventually, um, about four years into doing this myself, um, I find a coaching company because I'm a technician. I don't know how to run businesses. I don't know what profit and loss statements are. Um, I don't know how to run a business. I just know how to fix cars. Um, so I find an automotive coaching company and they really emphasize and train how to run a business. Um, how to read those profit and loss statements and balance sheets and marketing, um, taking care of your people and providing the best value to your customer. Um, once I joined with them, this was about four years ago. I've been working for myself for eight years now. Um, things just started to skyrocket. We made changes that just made things blow up. Um, about two years ago, the construction company that I was renting from um, said, hey, we sold the construction company and we're moving out. Would you like to buy the property? And they had their building and I had my building behind them. Um, but I also bought a lot, two lots down, um, to build my optimized auto repair shop on three years from that date. Um, and I said, no, I don't want to buy the property. It's not optimized for what I want to do and configured properly. Um, I'm going to build my own in three years on that lot next door. And they go, cool. Hopefully you like your new landlord. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> I'll buy, I'll buy the property. Um, I can't be put in that type of situation. Um, real estate for auto repair is a very challenging thing to find in Alaska. Um, so I bought the property from them. Um, COVID started to, well, before COVID, um, my service writer that I hired, um, Michelle, she's been with me for four years now. Um, I kept giving her more and more duties of, um, and responsibilities to take care of, um, beyond of just being a service writer. And it got to the point of we had enough technicians in the back and we had Michelle and other service writers in the front that I was running out of stuff to do. I kind of hired everyone to do what I needed to do. Um, so I said, hey, Michelle, you know what? I'm going to go run down to America, the lower 48, um, for a week and go visit a bunch of other auto repair shops in our um, shop coaching network. She said, well, how about you just don't come back? Really? Uh, okay, that's fine, but you're going to have to run this thing like I can if I'm not there. Um, I'm going to watch the numbers fairly closely, like I knew what numbers to watch at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, like I knew 
what to um, audit at that time. I didn't. Um, and we'll see. Um, so I was gone for about two and a half weeks and came back and then left again. Um, and I was kind of just in and out, um, bought a car in the lower 48 and I would just drive it from one place to another and then abandon the car and fly back to Alaska and then fly back to where the car was at and go wander again. Um, <laughs> just to get experience um, and see how other people are doing things. Um, even the total rock stars out there, um, if you can give some new type of perspective to their operation, um, I guarantee you're able to take away something to better your operation. Uh, so that really helped me see my facility from uh, a sky view the bird's eye view yeah um the covid stuff started to happen um so i decided it was a good time to get back to alaska um just because who knows what's going to happen in the world it's a scary time mm -hmm. um, so i go back in march and we tear the building apart and we're renovating and making sure everyone gets paid and we continue to market because my marketing company or my coaching company said, do not slow down. Do not lay people off. This will be a, an amazing time for you. If you can gain market share, mm -hmm. um, they never steered me wrong. So I did what they said to do and things just blew up. It's been crazy. Um, awesome. So now all the projects are done in our main store and I'm getting bored again. And I don't really know what to do. And I can't go wander because America shut down. Um, flying is scary. And Alaska was a pain in the butt to get in and out of during that time. Um, so I start looking for more buildings. Um, I find a premium building in a premium spot. And I go, let's start another location because I like building stuff and I like projects. Uh, so I was the guy that did nearly everything um, from grinding the concrete, painting the concrete floors to installing the lift, installing the airlines and painting and drywall and demolition and all that stuff. Um, so I complete, did pretty much everything um, to outfit that store. Mm -hmm. It was a lot of fun. Because I like projects and building stuff. That's all I want to do with my life. Um, how big? How big is this? Is this shop now? Uh, so second store is a five bay, and okay. big store is kind of a nine bay. Um, it's it's set up pretty weird. Um, we're going to modify the building some more to increase efficiency, um, but it it works. Yeah. Um, so it's a five bay, four twins in the drive on. Um, nice. It was an old DHL building. The doors are nine feet wide and there's eight to 10 inches worth of space in between each door. The lift columns are overlapping. This one picks up this car, and this one picks up this car. <laughs> um, it's a tight fit, but you make it work. Yeah. Um, and it works really well. Um, that store, we were, our brand recognition was already really strong in town. Um, so that store took off like a rocket ship. Um, we had 16 business days the first month that we opened and we did 65,000 in sales. Wow. The second month we opened, we were open, we did 95 and the third month we were, um, we did 125. Um, awesome. Yeah. Just total rocket ship. And it was a blast. Um, blew my expectations out of the water. Um, so I worked in that store as a technician um, for about three months while we were attempting to staff it. Um, we overstaffed store one and pulled from that to staff store two. Um, and that worked fairly well. Um, big problem with the Alaska market is the next sizable town from Fairbanks, Alaska is 350 miles south. Um, so it's really hard to get somebody talked into, hey, let's move to a town where it's negative 40 and <laughs> dark 20 hours a day. 
um, to come work on cars or sell service or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so we really only have the population of that town as a hiring pool. And that's what's held us back the most um, from growth is not being able to staff enough um, quality people because we don't want to damage our um, culture by having the wrong person in there. Mm -hmm. um, it can definitely just put a damper on everything. Um, and then it gets pretty frustrating. Um, so about three months into that store, um, Michelle, my manager comes at me and goes, John, we don't have very good continuity here. Um, you run things totally different. You give everything away for free and you're a terrible service writer and you're everybody's buddy. Um, and this isn't going to work. I go, yeah, I know. I know. Well, what, what's your proposal, Michelle, to get this second store cohesive with the first store? Um, she goes, well, I have to run both. Oh, okay. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> um, so that was about November of 2020. Um, during that time, I knew that I really liked Arizona and the Scottsdale area um, from when I went to school down here. Um, I'm into racing cars. Um, it's a great place to be staged out of for um, road track style racing. There's lots of racetracks nearby. Um, so my thought was to manage Alaska from a distance during the winter time and be in Alaska in the summertime, but move the, the Alaska toys that I was playing with in the summer to Arizona, um, where I can play with them in the winter. Um, and that was going really well until about, um, February of 21 when another um, friend in our automotive coaching group goes, hey, John, I was going to open a store in Arizona, a second store in Arizona in this location, um, but I've decided I don't want to do it. And because you're in Arizona right now, I think you should do it. So I don't want to do it. I'm just, just built one. I don't want to... I like building them for cash. This way there's less risk and worry and bills. Should I fail? It's not going to fail. Um, but it's, it just puts my mind at ease better. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to buy a house with the cash that I had saved up, not build another shop. Um, so the leasing company called me and they go, hey, John, we want you to lease this property. Um, so and so said you'd be a great tenant. I went, yeah, probably, but I don't want to do it. But if I was going to do it, what's what's the deal? Um, so they told me the deal with free rent and tenant improvement allowance and all the jazz to make it happen. Um, and I ran the numbers. And I went, eh, you know, it's not a bad deal, but it's not a great deal. So I came back to him and I said, well, this is the deal that I would need to make it work. He said, okay, when do you want to sign? Oh man. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Oops. Um, well, I need somewhere to work on my race car. So it's better than it's easier to build a shop than find a house with a big enough garage in Arizona. Uh, so let's build a shop. Um, so the plan was, is I wanted to do, I would like to do nine more of the autocorrect brand that's my arizona brand in the phoenix market um one is just not enough pressure to keep my add interested um if there's more pressure then i stay interested and have to um have to perform uh and i know i know that about myself now um i'm an 80 percenter I'll get about 80% of the way through a project, most every project, um, and then have to hire out the rest if mm -hmm. I want the project finished. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. You just have to know that about yourself um, and plan for those kinds of things so that you can get things done. Um, 
but store number three, autocorrect, opened up August 2nd here in the Arizona market. And I have very idealistic goals and thoughts and aspirations. Um, and it's performing to about 50% of what I was hoping for. Mm -hmm. um, but coming back down to ground level, um, I believe it's doing fairly well. Yeah. Um, the team is working well together. Um, customer satisfaction is through the roof. It's just the sales numbers aren't there yet. Mm -hmm. um, and I was thinking that the way my second store launched in Alaska, I could launch similarly um, here in Arizona. But it's no such thing. There's no brand recognition. Mm -hmm. It's in a building that was an auto repair shop. That's a great location, but it was a Pet Boys. And who likes Pet Boys? Yeah. Sorry if you're listening, Pet Boys. <laughs> um, but so people kind of steered away from it. It was empty for about a year. Um, but now all of our customers absolutely love it adore everyone that works there and think is the best thing ever. Um, we just have to get them back in to spend some more dollars and make that thing profitable. Yeah, no, definitely. And so what kind of the story that that is an amazing story and we're going to dig in a little bit deeper here. Um, so with this third location with now, I know you experienced the second location had that strong brand recognition. So I'm guessing there wasn't really much marketing that needed to be done for that location other than like, Hey, we're open. Is that kind of what I'm feeling here or is, is it uh, different? Yeah. Um, so there was some marketing. Um, I've experimented a lot with direct mail in Alaska. Mm -hmm. Um, and I really like referencing seasons and activities and what's going on in the world with marketing in general. Yep. Um, because I feel like people can relate to it a lot better. So if, especially if you're selling a certain service, um, Alaska is an extreme, extreme environment. Um, every car needs a block heater, an oil pan heater, a battery heater, a transmission heater, and their glycol rated down to negative 60. Uh, lots of people like a remote start so that you don't have to go outside and start your car at negative 40 and let it warm up for 30 minutes. You can do it from your bed. Um, and then as it snows, we like to switch to snow tires. Um, so using direct mail, um, has always been a struggle to make sure that offer lands the same time it's needed. Mm -hmm. um, it might snow, um, August 15th. It might snow December 31st. It's just the needs of Alaska. It does what it yeah. wants when it wants. Um, so I've realized that using social media, um, radio and Google ads works a lot better for that market. Um, just due to the mail takes about six weeks to get there, yep. um, from approval versus the lower 48 can take about two to three. Um, so it's just really hard to time. Um, some mail that we will do is, um, the tax refund checks. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that. It mm -hmm. looks like, a an IRS rebate yep. uh, envelope and all that jazz. And then you open it and it's a rebate coupon to use at the shop. Uh, so we'll send those out twice. Um, once towards the end of January, when people are getting all of their W2s and information and stuff like that. Um, and then we'll send one out more due to when taxes are due um, just to remind everyone again. Um, if we know when COVID was happening, if we know that the government was going to drop a stimulus check, yep. um, we would drop a stimulus check rebate, um, that looks similar. Um, just because, you know, somebody is really going to open that envelope and they're going to look at it. Yep. Um, and people love money. So if we can give away money, why not? Um, and then October, Alaska has the permanent fund dividend where it pays all of its residents um, a portion of the oil money. Um, it's anywhere from a thousand to two thousand dollars a person. The government's been taking a lot more of it lately, so it's been lower. Um, but a household of four will see four to eight thousand dollars show up in October. Um, so then we'll make sure we're doing 
callbacks on deferred work. Um, we'll send out another rebate check at that time. And that's kind of when we'll do our like Black Friday sales. Um, we'll cut oil change um, pricing. We'll put ads out there that's 10% off. Um, just anything we can do to increase volume. Um, it is, I understand why some people like to uh, make more per car. Um, I prefer to make less per car, but have a bunch more cars. Um, it definitely creates wiggle room um, and each car low owes less on overhead then. Um, so it's, it's just a lot more comfortable um, to increase volume than increase um, revenue per vehicle. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, that's an interesting take. And also for those, for those people that um, haven't caught on yet, the lower 48 just means the, the main, so I'm from Hawaii, so I, I caught on quickly. Okay. Uh, we call the, the, the lower 48 the mainland. We just, everything yeah. else is the mainland and then that we, we live in Hawaii. Um, and so, yeah, the lower 48, for those of you that don't know, it's just the big body of the main part of the U.S. That's just the place. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep. So, yeah. So, so yeah, so that, that, but that is, that is awesome information in terms of that second location. But now that, now we go to that third location where now it's in, it's in Arizona, there isn't brand recognition. So really you're kind of starting from scratch in a sense before just trying to find a target market, target audience. So how did you go about kind of doing that and creating that? Yeah. Um, so I did have a marketing agency assist me with getting everything set up. Um, we're running all types of social media. Um, we're doing direct mail, Google AdWords, Bing AdWords, Waze, Yelp. Um, I know lots of people don't like Yelp. I don't like Yelp. We have 10 reviews on Yelp for the new store. And none of them are recommended, even though some of these people have put 75 reviews out there on Yelp and whatever. Um, but to just have a little bit of something going through Yelp helps. It's better than nothing. Um, so just every platform that we can find. Um, I'm still looking for a spark plug outfit so I can put my minions in a spark plug outfit and dance on the side of the road. Um, but I haven't been able to find a spark plug outfit yet. Uh, and direct mail. Um, so we have about 30,000 potential customers um, in a one mile radius at the Arizona store. Wow. Um, we are doing direct mail to them. Um, we started mailing 30 days before we opened and we were hitting them every two weeks. Um, initially, we started with 80,000 and up income, 70 or 80, I don't remember. Um, and then I thought to myself, we probably need to also find a way to service our lower income customers in that area. Um, so we changed from a experienced based marketing and attempting to create an experience that sold our auto repair um, to also creating um, a mailer that sold value auto repair, um, value as in low cost auto repair. Um, so while we didn't necessarily change any prices, um, we showed that there were more discounts. We had financing available stickers on there more. Um, the big thing for me is I run a loss leader oil change. It's a full synthetic for 3867. Um, but I've never said that that's our price. I always say that's our sale price. Um, so in our higher income mailers, we just said full synthetic oil change special on sale for 3867. We didn't tell them the original price. Um, for our low income people, we said full synthetic oil change 50% off 3867 um, just to try and provide that value of, holy cow, I'm going to get something at 50% off. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. um, and then the financing options um, on the postcards um, in case their car needs more um, has provided a lot of comfort to them. Gotcha. Okay. That's really, that's really yeah. cool. Awesome. And then, so then now, let's kind of transition now to the, the processes, because I know that's what a lot of people 
that are in one shop right now are trying to figure out, yes, they want that second shop, but they don't know how to replace themselves. And so it sounds like um, you, you have a great employee on, on, on your team in, in Michelle. Um, but so did, were there processes that you created together? Were these processes that you relied on her to create? Or how, how did that kind of look from that first shop to then you were able to peel yourself off? And go um, yeah, so that's a really good question. Um, first off, it's super selfish. Um, I'm only going to do what I want to do. And if it's not what I want to do, I'm not going to do a good job at doing it. And I'm not going to want to do it. So it's not going to get done in a timely manner. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think that's just me. I think that's a lot of people out there. Absolutely. Um, you just have to accept it and embrace it and realize it. Um, and so if it's not something that I want to do, then it gets delegated um, to somebody that has a higher skill set than myself to do that. Um, you don't want to find, you can find somebody and train them and bring them up, but it's what your goal is, is not going to happen as quickly as you would like it to happen other than just hiring for that role. Um, my Alaska manager, Michelle, she's great. She's wonderful. She started not knowing where to put engine oil and anything about cars. Um, and now she manages two stores. My Arizona manager, I called somebody and I said, this is what you're going to get paid. This is where you're going. And would you like to take the job or not? These are, this is, these are my expectations. Um, and the Arizona store, I can be out of there for two weeks and um, know that my expectations are being withheld. Um, but you do need clear expectations of your team. Um, you need to have the processes of just what happens on the the day to day processes, the information that gets put in um, repair orders um, and things like that. The best thing that I can recommend, um, because we're all going to go back and audit um, repair orders, um, tickets, phone calls, things like that. Um, there should be enough information in my repair orders and all of the, all of what I'm looking at that I shouldn't have to ask any questions about what's going on. Um, I shouldn't say, Hey, is Mr. Smith's car still there? Um, when the ticket is, um, paid, but not closed. Um, there should be the pictures of the vehicle. There should be the notes. Um, I shouldn't have to open a repair order that's been open for two months and go, Hey, what, why is this repair order open for two months? Um, during the audit process, um, I should see that the computers on national back order because the microchip plant burnt down um, and the car is just stuck there and there's nothing we can do about getting it fixed. Uh, and so by having enough information that you don't have to ask questions, um, you're able to complete your audit process much quicker and without as much animosity. Um, the question why, if you say, hey, why is this this way? Um, it's almost accusational um, to a lot of people and they don't re um, receive that well. Um, I know I'm an abrasive character to start with. And so I'll just go, hey, why is it like this? I'm just being inquisitive, but it's pretty abrasive. Mm -hmm. um, and so to recognize that and to work on developing that, um, but to have enough information where you don't have to ask why or who or where or what. Um, if you find something that's wrong, um, to kind of be more gentle about it, um, and more of a, a learning tool than a, Hey guys, we did this wrong type of deal. Hmm. Um, find out why these decisions were made, um, the thought process behind decisions and go from there. Okay. And then, and so you, so you mentioned, um, a couple of times that like, um, having clear expectations. And so 
I would love to dig in a little bit deeper on like, yeah. what are some examples of these expectations that you set forth right in the beginning that you know if they meet them, that they're going to be a very good um, team member of, of your crew? Um, yeah, so it, it definitely varies on the role um, that you're hired for. Um, I don't really work with technicians anymore in the shops. Um, the shop foreman in Alaska is more responsible for the hiring. Um, he's responsible for the problem things. Um, the service writers, I don't really work with anymore. Um, I work through my managers um, to service my teams. Um, so you make a list of your expectations to give to your manager um, to make sure things are done properly. Um, I don't know who or where, um, but somebody told me that you should only have five people reporting to you and that your manager should only have five people reporting to them um, before it becomes chaotic. Mm. Um, so if, if I have people that shouldn't be reporting to me telling me about problems, then I have to go back and correct stuff somewhere else. Um, it's a hundred percent open door. If somebody wants to say, Hey, we have a problem. We have an issue um, with so-and-so or something like that. That's fine. Um, open door. Let me know. I want to know about it. Um, but you probably shouldn't be calling me to say, what do we do? We backed a car into a telephone pole. We've done it before. We've solved this problem before. Follow the procedure of what mm -hmm. we did last time. Um, now I'm really bad at writing stuff down. So lots of the expectations um, with my managers is verbal um, and texted or emailed back and forth, um, but they don't have a handbook to work off of. Um, and that's a fault of mine. I do believe that we should have an operations manual that Yes, I want you to think organically and I want you to do what you think is best. Um, but if it's just mind blown, you call me, my phone, I don't pick up. You have the manual to open um, to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, no, same sort of way where it's like I, SOPs, those standard procedures, having them written down are so important. But they're also, they're also like hard getting in that. Uh, regular habit of making sure those are all written down. So but I love that you, you, you're very good at acknowledging these things that you're not as strong suited at and then hiring them out. And that's what I love. Um, I'm sure that's one big reason why you've been so successful this at this point in time with your different shops and hitting all your big goals. Um, but not slightly back to now, man, so I know you, you are kind of in both Alaska and Arizona and managing each shop from before when you're not in that exact place. And so what um, are there certain reports or things that you have the shop send out or that are already, are, maybe they're already automated or what does that look like that gives you a firm touch point and like, yep, yep, yep. And okay, we're, we're good to go. Um, so at the beginning of the year, I set sales goals uh, um, for my team. Um, that sales goal gave them a monthly number and it gave them a ARO. Um, I gave them a gross profit per build hour and a gross profit percentage. Um, so I don't need to talk about the, those goals with the team every month. Um, we will build that again on the first of the year and we will put it out to the teams in each store um, so that they understand their expectations. Um, something that was coached to me recently um, and I'm adapting into my companies right now is I would like to transition my managers into being paid based off of net profits uh, because they do control net profits. Mm -hmm. um, we can waste a lot of resources in overhead um, with silly stuff, but if they understand that they're in charge of the finances and they own and operate it as their store, even if their name isn't on the LLC, um, they can make more money. Um, so we're working with my profit and loss statements right now. Um, 
my Alaska stuff is a little bit of a mess. Um, we outgrew the person that was doing it. I mm -hmm. love the person that was doing it. She was wonderful. Um, it's just, we transitioned away from each other. Mm -hmm. um, so things are a bit of a mess and we're correcting that right now. Um, my future goal is we will review the prior month profit and loss statement, and then we will build a profit and loss statement based off of expectations for the next month. Um, so if we're in December, we're going to review uh, November and we're going to build a PL for January. Mm -hmm. um, we might talk about, hey, you know what? January is fairly slow. Um, let's increase our marketing budget by a thousand dollars or January is just organically great. Let's reduce our marketing budget or, Hey, John, you know what? We need a couple new computers, something like that. Um, and this way we're able to take our total revenue projection for that month, um, plug in our average for tech labor, our average for parts, um, and then our averages for our gross profit. And we should be able to write down and figure out what our net profit should be um, at the end. Um, this is not what I'm doing yet. It is what I will be doing um, based off of my coach's recommendations. Mm -hmm. My coach that does way more than I do um, in sales out of one store and who also works remotely. Um, he told me that he's not going to be back in his store until March. Wow. So I think I have the right coach to, to keep me going. Oh, definitely. That's awesome. So what, in terms of like net profit percentages and things like that, are, are there certain goals that you shoot for at each shop? Is it different for each shop or is it kind of like you expect this to be around here across the board? Um, I do have certain expectations. Um, I'm changing a lot right now. Um, each shop used to pay a bookkeeper. Um, each shop was just responsible for itself. Mm -hmm. um, but the main store always gets stuck with the extra financial burden of John's needs or the company needs. Um, if, because in Alaska, there's two stores. Um, if we have, hoodies and shirts that we use for uniforms made main store just pays for it small store doesn't reimburse based off of its needs yep. um, so the the net profits are lower at the main store um, just due to things like that mm -hmm. um, i do have certain revenue goals for them um, and expectations um, normally pretty outlandish, but we're able to get stuff done. Um, and that's, that's something that I'm still working on um, improving in the future is um, what those expectations are and reviewing those reports more um, with the management team so that they have a lot more ownership of what's going on and they can understand the, the finances as well. Um, I'm not scared about sharing the numbers with them um, because I believe that they need to know mm -hmm. um, if there's a big, huge number at the bottom um, that shows we made 35% net profit, which happens some months out of Alaska. Um, and they go, so you get to keep 80 grand. Go, no, I don't keep 80 grand. I've shared my vision with you about what I would like to build and when we have months like this, this is what builds second stores. Um, we would like to build a third store in Alaska. Um, so this revenue is set aside for future growth. So I love the transparency that you, that you have um, with your team. Uh, I mean, it's super important to understand financials. I know for sure um, that's just crucial in, in running in running the business. So. Um, I love that you already you already go forth and do that. Um, your your second location. So I know you, you mentioned it um, really briefly. You started off at sixty five and it grew to one twenty in a span of three months. So that, that that's that's pretty that's pretty crazy. And so I I would love to hear how like 
if you, if you were already like prepared for that huge influx to come in in such a short amount of time in this new location or just what kind of the whole situation behind, behind that short burst of growth? Yeah. Um, so my thought was, is we were going to do 30, 60, 90 in 30, 60, 90 days, mm-hmm. not 60, 90, 120. <laughs> um, by working in that store as a technician myself, um, I'm able to get a lot done. Um, and if you're working side by side with me, holy cow, you'll be motivated to get a lot done too. Um, these, every shop is packed full of Sono speakers, um, play fives, subs, um, bright lights, and we are jamming, slamming Red Bulls and getting it done. Um, so the production from my teams um, is can be pretty outlandish um, for their sizes. Um, so by being a technician in that store, um, for those first three months, we were able to complete everything that um, came in. Um, now that I'm not in that store, um, we are struggling with completing the work um, just due to technician shortages. Yep. Um, and by golly, we're, we're trying to find people, but I only want the best. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Okay, well, the, the last sort of question uh, before I let you go, um, but what are your like top three KPIs and of, of what you look at across the board that kind of helps show you how effective or successful a shop is currently? Yeah. Um, so I like looking at um, total revenue. Uh, I mean, man, there's a, there's a lot. Um, yeah. I know. I'm sorry for limiting just the three, but I'm just trying to three. Yeah. No, I'm going to have to think about that for a second. Um, it's, let me think about that. Uh, it's been a lot of fun, um, with the growth plan to nine more shops. Um, I've only built them from scratch and I've been doing a lot more, um, shopping for shops, um, visiting businesses that are for sale, Mm -hmm. um, evaluating the property, um, evaluating the business and um, trying to figure out if it's something worthwhile. Um, so I think if, if I had to make a rash evaluation of a business, um, I'm going to want to see the car count. I'm going to want to see the marketing expense and I'm going to want to see the ARO. Um, with those three things, I'm able to determine um, a lot. If you have a fairly low marketing expense and a high car count, you're effective. You have a good brand. Um, if your ARO is in a good good range, then the team is doing proper inspections. Um, your tech quotes are high enough. Um, and those, those are the main things. Um, focus on the basics, just simple, simple things, um, because those simple things are what's going to kick your butt. Yes, definitely. Well, thank, thank you. you again. This has been super helpful. Is there any last tidbit or quote that you can share with everyone that will kind of help them going into this new uh, 2022 year? Yeah. Um, Going into a new year, I would definitely say write down your goals, write down your expectations, and be transparent with your team on those things. Um, The next thing that you have to do is get out of your own way. Um, If you're hemming and hawing over a decision, just jump. Just pick a direction, left or right, but you got to move. If you don't move, you're going to stay stagnant, and you're going to be in the same position you were last year and the year before, and you're not going to be happy at the end of 22. Um, the, a wrong decision is just a new way to not do something. Um, you, lessons are expensive, but you have to go out and learn your lessons. I love that. Well, thank you again, John, for coming on um, today. Um, really appreciate your time. 
Um, for those of you that, for those people that maybe want to reach out to you and ask you any questions, what's the best way for them to reach out to you? Yeah. Um, email works great. Um, you can email me any thoughts, ideas, questions. Nothing is too outlandish. Um, John, J O H N, at autosolveus.com. A U T O S O L V E U S.com. Perfect. All right. Well, thank you for being here. Thank you, everyone, for listening. And we hope to talk to you guys soon. Awesome. Thank you.